Welcome to the fourth ASEAN EU Cooperation and Scholarship Day. You are now in the reception area. Here is the list of events we have prepared for you. Click on the schedule button to get a reminder on your phone or devices. Just dropping in to see what's on? Find this little red button to see which event is currently live and just join the fun. Take the time to explore the expo area and see what have been prepared for you. Here on the booth panel, you can have a one-on-one -on -one Q and A session with our exhibitors. Download all the information that interests you, join workshops and sessions, or try out the games. Each session also has its own booth panel for you to interact with the speakers. To have a conversation with an expo representative, click share video and audio. The booth moderator will allow you to have a conversation with them. Have something to say? Head on over to the Voice of Youth booth. Pick your virtual background and overlay and say it with a photo or video. Don't forget to follow and tag at EU in ASEAN when you post it on social media. You might be the lucky winner to get a special hamper from the EU. We're so excited to have you here and we wish you a good time. Good afternoon. Welcome to the fourth ASEAN EU Cooperation and Scholarship Day 2021. I'm Nabila Ernada and I'll be your moderator for this session. We all do some sort of photography every day, from the simple selfie, taking pictures of our food, or even our love beloved pets. Today, we'll be discussing how we can use these visuals and the form of photography as a form of activism. We'll be joined today by some amazing speakers from Malaysia, Cambodia, and Vietnam. The first we have is Anis Lin, a documentary and sports photographer based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. She visually documents stories that resonate with topics of critical importance. As a former national figure skater, her transition into documentary sports photography led her to become the first and only Malaysian female photographer whose work has been accredited for Pyeongchang 2018 Winter Olympics and Tokyo 2020 Summer Olympics. Hello, Anis. Next, we have Shunsuke Miyatake, or Take, a Japanese photographer who is based in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. He's witnessed the plight of many Cambodians during the pandemic and started the project called Art for Food. We'll get to know more about this project later on in the session. And last, we have Zi Duyen, a photographer from Saigon, Vietnam. She works mostly as a portrait photographer and has been taking pictures since she was 12 years old. So welcome everyone. I'm very excited to be here with you all. Thank you for having us. Hey. Hello. Hi. So I think today is a very interesting topic, and I think we can just go ahead and begin. Uh, first off, I have a question for the three of you. So you all come from a photography background. I want to know what made you choose photography as your medium of expression. Perhaps Anis can answer first. Oh, thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me and super glad to be here. I think to answer your question, um, why did I choose photography as a, as a form of expression? Because I do believe that um, photography has a tool for change. It has the magnitude to inform, reform, and connect with others. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Anis. I think it's really good that it's a, a way to sort of talk to people without actually talking to people. Yeah, I because really I, moving. yeah, I think earlier, like I say that as photographers, we are naturally born introverts, but that allows us to sort of make a change to tap into people's life and to make people feel like they have been seen and be heard and to be understood through like they tell us the story and it's our job to actually illustrate it in do them justice in a form of uh, photography, like in art and a form of photography. All right. Thanks, Anis. Um, maybe Take can answer the next um, bit. Why did you choose yes. photography? Yeah. Uh, I'm working for the advertising agency since 2005. And uh, I was super busy. And uh, I had uh, two kids, but I don't have any enough time to hang out with them uh, on weekdays. But uh, with iPhone. I started from iPhone uh, 2010, and uh, every weekend I can bring them uh, to different places and uh, for recording. 
with the Japanese cultural places with my kids. That is my starting point. And uh, moving to Cambodia in 2016, and uh, I am living separately from my family now, so I cannot take my kids. Uh, so I changed the theme uh, to the everyday life in Cambodia. So photography for me is documenting my life around us, and uh, I want to chase the human moments or the humanity in everyday life around us. That's the that's why uh, I'm sticking to the photography and taking photos. So it's like a sort of journal you keep, but I think a more purposeful journal. Yeah. There's a lot of things that you can do from it. That's great. Yes. And Z, how about you? Why did you choose photography as your medium? Uh, hi, guys. Uh, well, to be honest, I don't feel like I has chosen photography. Uh, photography has chosen me uh, because it just came to me in a very natural way. Uh, the first time I bought a camera uh, uh, when I was in college studying graphic design. And the reason I bought it is because my teacher told me that it could be useful for my uh, study. Uh, at that time, I, I didn't have I didn't know anything about photography. I didn't know how to use a camera. But the first time I take pictures with that camera, I fell in love immediately. Um, it, it was magical to me. It opened the whole new world to me. And every time I look at the world through a camera, I felt like um, Alice in Wonderland. Yeah, to be honest, it, it always feel like that. And from that moment, I just kept taking pictures and I never wondered about it. Wow. That's when you hear your true calling, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's something <laughs> I like, think your true calling is there in photography. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like I was born to meet photography and take a long journey with it. That's really wholesome to hear. Uh, I, I'm glad that you're happy with it. So uh, again, a question for all three of you. Um, I want to ask you, what, decide, what makes you decide what to take photos of? So I know you all have quite different subjects, uh, mm -hmm. quite different um, approaches to. And I'd also like to ask how much of the photos that you take reflects on what you think or your beliefs. So maybe Anis, if you're ready to answer. Mm, yeah, what makes me decide to take photos of? I think it's more towards a, hu a human connection because I think I was raised by, born and raised by two parents who are social workers. So for me, like every time when, while they're doing their work, a social worker in terms of like, they are in charge of an organization that caters for old folks, uh, old folks and children, uh, orphanages. So growing up, I have a bunch of friends who are in the children home and I have a lot of grandparents as well. And I always wanted to know that, how can I connect with them? So I will bring my camera there as well. and. From that, in the humanity side, it also it collided with sports photography that I want to see it differently because uh, coming as a former national sports athlete, I realized that the media always, on, or the media and I think everyone in general, they only celebrate the glorious moment and they never see like the hardships or the behind the scenes, not just the athletes itself, but the coaches, the core team, the officials and the family. So I do, ultimately, I do believe that uh, imagery has a voice, that it has the ability to kind of like narrate the past and construct the future that is visible and transformative. Wow. Um, that's really good. So for the people who uh, are in the audience, Anis just came back from the 2021 Tokyo Olympics, and we hope to be seeing some of your work that shows all of that behind the scene action and um, care in it. So thank you. Uh, Taki, if you're ready to answer. Yeah, what makes me to take photos? Mm, uh, as I said, I told you uh, just before, <clears throat> I started from iPhone and uh, I didn't have any subject at the beginning and I randomly take photos. I didn't even know uh, how to focus and how to use the grid, those kind of things. And uh, one by one, I learned uh, from my friends and iPhone, even iPhone, uh, taking a good moment, good picture. So for me, uh, camera or iPhone was 
uh, it doesn't matter uh, at the beginning. And uh, yeah, the job and the work and life balance makes me uh, take my iPhone and bring my kids to the cultural, his, uh, cultural uh, place, historical place in all over Japan. Uh, only weekend I had a time to hang out with my family. So that literally uh, made me to take photos with my kids, with my family, with the cultural places. So it makes me think about the different theme, like a Japanese cultural uh, places, not the, just the beautiful moments, but also how to capture the emotions or the feelings of my kids with the places. And after coming to Cambodia, that uh, subject is always changing. Uh, I cannot take pictures of my kids with the Japanese culture places. So how about taking uh, pictures of the life and uh, everyday people on the street, like uh, naturally changing the theme. And uh, it doesn't uh, take my time so much, just around going around my house and going to uh, different provinces sometimes uh, because of the business trip. And uh, after working, I go around the uh, cities and taking photos of the people's beautiful moment. It, uh, I'm not so much interested in beautiful places or the popular spots, but rather than that, I want to take original photo, like Annie said, like a unique way in different perspective. Um, those kind of uh, the feeling for chasing the, how to say, the human human moments like a humanity moment that makes me always take photos i see again i think it's uh the human connection human to human um mm -hmm. and trying to take it take a look at something from a completely different perspective yeah so thank you take and z uh well just right away i uh become a photographer, the way I take photos of portraits, uh, especially uh, for women, just feels natural to me. Um, I'm just, uh, I, I just love doing this in uh, the beginning. Uh, I'm really attracted to uh, portrait and uh, women's ability. Um, but, uh, but the way I take pictures uh, has trend through the years. Uh, since photography really connects to my thoughts and uh, my view of life. Um, in my, I remember in my first year, I used to use Photoshop to uh, create pictures with uh, impression, with strong impression and uh, fun and fantasy voice. Um, I use Photoshop to uh, record pictures by uh, adding uh, textures and effects like uh, clouds, smoke. Um, uh, I even edited models of faces to have a perfect look. But as I grow older, uh, my view of life has strength. So my vision in photography has strength too. Uh, now I uh, love simple, uh, natural and uh, emotional things. I, uh, uh, now I uh, rarely use Photoshop. I uh, mostly use Lightroom just to uh, uh, retouch the color. There is no much difference um, uh, between uh, before and after images, uh, except the colors. I um, I used to uh, pursue perfect looks in photography, but now I only uh, uh, seek for natural light and uh, emotion in photography. I think that that's great. So as a photographer or an artist, um, it really translates from your beliefs to the product and even the tools that you use. So you've even yes. minimized uh, the use of Photoshop and trying to make things look uh, maybe shiny is the word. But yes. I like how all of you kind of have the, the same uh, silver lining of wanting to go for a more emotional, raw and real uh, yes. perspective on things. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so now I have a question for Take. I would really like to know more about Art for Food in Cambodia. Can you tell us more about this project? Yeah. Uh, Art for Food is uh, born <clears throat> during the pandemic uh, in April. Uh, Cambodia has locked down since the end of April um, for one month, around one month. 
And during that time, uh, the stores and the business are locked down and nobody can go uh, outside. And uh, there was a red zone, orange zone, and yellow zone. Yellow zone and orange zone, uh, the people living there can go out and get the food and drink as usual. Uh, but the red zone people has to stay at home uh, and cannot literally go out. So I am a photographer taking photos on the street every, almost every day. And uh, I was thinking how to help them. This is super, super difficult for them. Even delivering, a delivery guy cannot go into that red zone. So how to survive? So I was thinking, uh, what can I do uh, with the photography or something creative thing? So I have a lot of uh, photography friends here in Cambodia. So one of the friends called Raphael, he's a French Cambodian, is also having a same uh, question. Hey, Take, let's make a, a photography and uh, make a donation, raising, uh, raising money uh, through the photography. So we started Art for Food and the call for uh, the entry, like a photography and the art uh, from Cambodia and outside of Cambodia. And I built up a website uh, in two days and uh, 90 artists from all over the world joined that uh, movement and we sell uh, all the pictures uh, from $10, $20, $30 $10. and all the profits going to the uh, those kind of people in need and uh, in one month we raised to 15k dollars and uh, we make that money to make a meal and all the meal food is made by the street vendors and the street vendors make a meal and the secret drivers going and delivering foods to the places who cannot go outside so uh this is a project uh for giving back those kinds of emotions and the connections to the people in need Wow, that's great. So you guys made a site in two days? Yeah. Wow. Um, I'm really happy to hear that it turned out to be a very communal effort with your uh, photographer friends in Cambodia. I think 90 artists is a lot to round up. Yeah. And the amount of money you guys raise is also an amazing amount. So that's really great. Um, so for people at home, if you want to take a look at the project, it is um, at art for for the number food KH. So go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Take. So next, I want to ask Lynn. Um, you founded the woman photographer Malaysia. Uh, maybe you could talk to us about your motivation to start it. I think I think uh, same as Take as well. Um, Women's Photographer in Malaysia. It was established uh, in the, I think at the peak of the pandemic, which we started. Uh, we had the ideas. We did uh, we did the logos and everything and branding all in four days. No, <laughs> yeah, we we didn't do a side. I think Take is more extreme than that. But yeah, we did it. We started off with Instagram because I understand that we have limited resources at that time. So it's just me. And my fellow co-founder, we call it the Shutter Sister, uh, Aisha Naza, my co-founder. Um, she's a photographer as well. So we founded this Women's Photographer in Malaysia. Basically, it was something that reflects to us that when we first started out, we do not have the right support system nor the any of the resources. So ultimately, uh, Women's Photographer in Malaysia, it's a collective that that we hope to develop an inclusive culture that increases gender e uh, equality and it helps better to strive balance in the industry to ensure better support and empower for women's photographer through visual storytelling. So as months goes by, we learn a lot. We had a lot of activities, uh, both for men and women in terms of workshops, but we do keep a little secret, uh, I think special and secret for ourselves called afternoon tea with women's photographer, uh, with women's photographer in Malaysia in terms of like when you come together, it's like a round table discussion that we can talk about anything and everything. For example, like you have period in in the midst of your assignment, what do you do and stuff like that. We share tips and tricks or we go minimal with makeup. So it's like beyond photography, but more in the touch with the uh, women's sentiment. And ultimately, we just want to champion women 
to just uh, to just encourage more everyone. And for now, uh, for women's photographer in Malaysia, we do open to listen to everyone. So it caters for three types of three types of demographic in terms of Malaysian women currently reside in Malaysia or any individual who identify themselves as women. And the second will be expat, which is anyone you could be Japanese, Russians, but you are currently calling Malaysian home that you could join. Uh, I would say that Women's Photographer Malaysia will be a part of you as well. And the third one, which is really special, which is Malaysian abroad. Yeah. If let's say you're a Malaysian, uh, you are women Malaysian currently situated in Australia, America and US, uh, America, US and UK, that you are able to join Women's Photographer Malaysia. So it provides a piece of home for you as well. Wow. So how many people are joining the uh, Women Photographer Malaysia collective right now? I think we have a private group in Facebook just to share like resources or what kind of bags or lenses to sell. I think that that we have like around 170 plus members for that. And currently, I think the following is growing through our Instagram. So you guys, any of you out there who are Malaysians, or Malaysian or abroad or calling Malaysia home, or just basically anyone really, you can just follow us at Women's Photographer MY on Instagram. And we have like free workshops coming out. I think uh, what makes these groups really great is the shared and collective experiences that each individual has um, that actually happens to a lot of people at the same time. And it just kind of reminds you, especially in times like this, that uh, we're not sitting here alone. Um, there's other people who are going through the same thing. And um, we got this together. I feel like that's the spirit. <laughs> so uh, coming to the next question, uh, like right now, digital technology has brought us closer. It's also brought visual arts to become more closer and accessible for us. Uh, can you guys give any recommendations or sort of any spiels on how can we use digital technology as a tool to express our voices as youth? Maybe from Z first. Um, well, I think as a photographer, uh, voices uh, are feelings to me. Uh, I take pictures to uh, express uh, my ineffable feelings. Um, maybe uh, my feelings are created during the process of taking pictures. Uh, but uh, I share pictures and feelings to connect with people. And um, the popularity of digital technology, especially uh, smartphones and uh, social media, uh, uh, has made easier for me to uh, do that um, because, and uh, it's uh, unlimited because now everybody can see my pictures and visit my website. Now I can share a picture on social media and I uh, can uh, receive uh, people's uh, reaction immediately. Um, and uh, I think it's the way for me to say that uh, I'm here, I have these uh, ineffable feelings uh, that I don't know how to describe, but I uh, but I think my pictures can do that for me. And I know there are people out there who uh, uh, feel the same way because uh, people uh, have sent messages uh, to tell me about that. Um, so uh, I think uh, and um, I think we we do feel uh, more connected, and we feel uh, we're not along with these feelings or. We're not along uh, for loving these kind of feeling by sh sharing our voices. And in my case, it's my feelings uh, through digital technology. Again, uh, I think every one of you uh, have different sort of goals and different visions with these platforms that you made, but it's all the same. It's sort of to create the connection, create the human to human feeling again. And uh, I think it's it's great and it's accessible. That's what I love. Everyone from all over the world can see. So I'm going to ask a question from our audience. Uh, we have Angela from the Philippines. What advice can you give to youth who lost the spark in taking pictures or in photography in general? especially today during the pandemic, because you aren't able to go out and capture. Also, hi from Philippines. So uh, maybe, Taki, if you'd like to answer first. Oh, uh, I'm literally locked down in, in this house for three weeks. I'm taking pictures uh, of the people living in this house. 
and uh, even without going the street, I I can chase the moment of the uh, human and family uh, kinds of moment, even without the beautiful background. I think there is a beautiful uh, beauty in the action or the conversation or the interaction with the people. So, and I started from iPhone and changed to the camera. And uh, I don't, I don't think uh, we or everybody needs such kind of expensive camera. Uh, even the iPhone or the Samsung camera, uh, we can take pictures of those kind of beautiful moments. So, uh, how to see the world or the how. To how do you want to see the world it matters, I think. So that's the answer for me. Is that correct? Uh, I don't know. No, I think it, nothing is correct, nothing is wrong. Here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, that's, that's true. I think, I think what you're also just trying to say is anyone can really just start on doing it if you want to see, and there isn't. Uh, there isn't any guidebook or rule book to yeah. sort of express or communicate what you want to communicate. Um, I'm going to link up to the next question we have. Uh, so personal preferences aside, what do you think makes a ph ph photograph so captivating for a wide range of audiences? So perhaps Anis, you could uh, take a shot at answering this. All right, I'll, I'll give it a shot. So I guess I uh, echo what Take was saying that uh, inspiration comes from all aspects in life. It's like, I think in the realm of social media, it acts it act as our window because we are so grounded. Technically, we are very grounded and locked in within now. Then we are looking out and our, I think basically our phone, it's our window to look up. So it's really up to us that whether we get, uh, we get influenced by the outside world or we use ourselves to collect ourselves to construct our own visual narrative to give our voice to be out there. So I think in terms of how do we take photos that compare with the world, with the current, like, let's say if you're locked down and everybody was thinking, like, oh, I can create, I can create a creative visual because I'm in. So I would say that um, try to try to think a different way that either you come, either this pandemic has confirmed you coming from a place for fear, from fear or you can change it in a way that this pandemic actually provides opportunities for more possibilities. That being said, I would think that the, we we as a whole accountable to what we are putting out there as well on social media nowadays in terms of photos, videos, or content. So, it's, so everyone has a voice. And one thing I learned lately, it's that as cliche as it sounds, it says that with great platform comes great responsibility. So I think it's a matter of how you're using that and not to give excuses. And again, I can't stress enough that I changed the way I look at this pandemic is where either, I will repeat again, either you come this from a place of fear or you see this pandemic as a place of opportunity for more possibility to continue to create. It's all about sort of uh, shifting the perception and uh, I feel like it's just to do what you want to do, right? It's if you have something that you want to do, then there's nothing really stopping you right now. And uh, with the pandemic or not, and with maybe the what categorizes as a captivating photograph, like that really depends on you, right? So yeah. I think uh, there aren't, again, set of rules or anything to start um, uh, using photography as a form of communication or even activism. I have one last question from the audience. Uh, it's um, pretty different from the others, but I think it's very relatable to today's um, digital era. So with cloud computing nowadays, sharing information with others is quite common. Do you think sharing photos with others is safe? Any advice on this? Uh, <laughs> look at all your faces. <laughs> so. I'm not sure if any of you want to take up this question. Uh, Z, if you have an answer already, you can. If Taka, you have an answer, if Anis, I, I can. In, um, in terms of sharing the photos is safe, as in like personal photos or the photos that it will automatically use it without watermark. I think that's mm -hmm. a, I think mm -hmm. that's a, we're missing that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, would, uh, I would assume it's the watermark if I'm not sure is the uh, on board me. So let's say um, from 
I think in the realm of social media, it could be somehow swept in, uh, I think kind of dissolved in the cyber universe. So for the Olympics photos, for example, I had to put a watermark because it would somehow just get lost in the middle and with such demand at that time and such in such compelling moment at that time, I make a conscious choice with my client to actually put a watermark in that case to actually show the world that yes, even though it has been shared and spread across, at least people know that where it come from. And I think when it comes to using watermark to like kind of like to put a stamp to identify the photo, we have to be um I think be in a way to honor the photo as well and in the meantime to just like have a little easter egg somewhere in our photo to show people like hey this is me uh, i took this photo like just just gonna shout out to that so i think back to again in terms of sharing information we just have to prior before sharing or prior before hitting share or post we just have to be cautious and be accountable of what we put out it and to also face the consequences whether good or bad Okay, um, did anyone else want to add into this? Take, do you have any opinions? Um, yeah, uh, in the Art for Food campaign, uh, we collected five photos uh, per person and uh, we had uh, 90 people. So four, more than 400 art and the photos in our website. And uh, from international order, us, from outside, uh, we cannot ship uh, during the pandemic. So we we just use the cloud sourcing and the computing and sharing the digital data. But uh, we had a contract between the uh, customer and uh, us. And uh, only the customer who uh, sign on our contract uh, get that data. Like such kind of contract or protecting us and them and the artists in our campaign, uh, I think it was necessary uh, to protect those kind of copyrights uh, uh, points of view. Yeah, agreed, agreed 100%. Um, and uh, it, it is getting to the time where anything is, you have something online and it's online mm. somewhere else. Like you have it here and it's popping up somewhere else. So mm. yeah, it's a day, I think watermarking and sort of having a great um, bindment when you're trying to exchange your um, art pieces. Uh, it's very good like that. So thanks so much, guys. Unfortunately, I have to wrap up this session. Um, if anyone has any questions for our panelists, you can ask them in the comment box and they will um, stand by and say hi to you and respond via chat. But if any of you would like to know more on social advocacy, tomorrow we have a similar session called Art Vocacy, where I will be talking to other Southeast Asian artists on their work. And of course, for those who are looking for scholarship opportunities, um, we will also have Uni Itali to sort of explain the scholarship opportunities in Italy to pursue your visual and art passion. Uh, and for all of you photographers or photography lovers, the EU delegation to ASEAN currently has a photography competition for ASEAN youth. You can find out more about this competition or in the, and the information on EU in ASEAN .eu or at EU in ASEAN social media channels. Make sure to participate. Share your photos and don't forget to tag us. Uh, thanks so much for joining in. If anyone else um, wants to say anything, don't forget to just comment. And I hope to see you soon uh, at the ASEAN EU Cooperation and Scholarship Day 2021. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, guys.